for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to continue to speak, of course, on a theme I've been speaking about for a while, kings and priests. But today, the message is entitled, Know Your Enemy. Amen. Know Your Enemy. Amen. If you're going to enter into worship and warfare, you need to know your enemy, and then you'll understand what God is doing in your lives. God bless you. Good to see you today. Amen. Hallelujah. So, let me introduce you to someone that you may know personally or you may have only heard of. His name is Hillel ben Shakar. Hillel ben Shakar. That's his name in Hebrew. That's the name he has in the Bible. We know him by many different names. But on our journey to enter into New Testament priesthood, and becoming mature and going on to perf from the elementary principles of understanding Christ into perfection or maturity. And what will we do? We will do this if what? If God permit. Amen. When your kids are good, you permit them to do things. Okay, you're entitled to it now. But when you're entitled to it because by age, but they're not doing well, you don't let them do it. Isn't that right? Well, the Lord says that he is bringing us into maturity, and we will go there if he permits us. In other words, he's bringing us into perfection. He's bringing us to a higher realm, a better place, where we understand him and know him as a New Testament priest. We understand we're not offering up sacrifices of blood and bulls and goats. We're not, we're not burning things on an altar somewhere. We're not in some hot tent somewhere doing that type of stuff. We don't have symbolism only. We have the reality. Communion too many people misunderstand communion. It is not a symbol of his body and blood. It is his body and blood. Jesus said, my flesh is true food, which means it is a spiritual substance. He said, my blood is true drink, which means it is a spiritual substance. Now, faith is a spiritual substance. Glory is a spiritual substance. The body and the blood are spiritual substance. They're real. It's not a symbol. Don't ever treat it like a symbol. Well, we take the elements. These are not elements. Elements are gold and water and, and minerals and ores and things like that. These are real, true food. And as New Testament priests, we come and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says, and I love some of the verses that say, when we give God ourself, our body, our life, our daily life, we are giving him our reasonable worship. It makes sense. Every day, give him your life. So on our journey into maturity and New Testament priesthood, there's another level that we want to get to, and that is the authority of being a king. Roman, Revelation in, cha in chapter 5, verse 9 says, he has made us kings and priests. Who is made into a king and a priest? Those who overcome. Now, overcomers. Real quick, this is just an introduction to help you get your mind set. What is an overcomer? Well, an overcomer must be a miracle worker, must be somebody who does all these amazing things, must be a great preacher like Brother Dupre. You know, that's an overcomer. No, an overcomer is a person who has overcome, guess what? Their own flesh, lustly, lust desires, the pride of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of the eye. That is the overcomer. The overcomer is not the one who preaches great. The overcomer is not the one that works a miracle. The overcoming, those are gifts. Overcoming is a work. It is a fruit. It is something you work at and you make it be produced in your life and you crucify the flesh with its desires and you live your life unto God. That's what makes an overcomer. That's why everyone can enter into the authority of kingship. Everyone. You just need to start with yourself. If you can't have authority over your life, how are you going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ? The overcomer sits on a throne with God. The overcomer reigns on the earth. The underachiever worships at the throne forever. Hey, that's not a bad place. Hello? So it's not that you're going to miss out on a lot, but the overcomer, see, the, the underachiever, the one who's saved and dies and goes to heaven. The thief on the cross will be ever at the throne of God saying, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank He's a worshiper for all of eternity. 
It says that they will be at the throne worshiping forever. But the overcomer follows the lamb wherever he goes. You think God's going to sit on a throne forever? He's an active God. He's a creating God. He's got new universes to create. He's got new things to do. And what are we going to do? Those who overcome, those who crucify the flesh with its lust and its desires, those who stop listening to the, to the pride of life, those who put the lust of the eye in its place, those who do those things, the overcomer, they will follow the lamb wherever he goes. Hallelujah. Into new things, uncharted waters. So let me introduce you to our enemy, Hillel ben Shakir. There's a saying, know your enemy. You must know your enemy. Your enemy is not sitting in church behind you or across the aisle. Your enemy is not on your job at a different station. Your enemy is not the clerk in the store who never treats you properly. People are not your enemies. They are your potential brothers and sisters in Christ if they're not saved. And if they are saved, then they are potentially a person who can rise up if you will crucify your feelings, your emotions, your anger, your stuff, and you will say, Lord, I pray for that one. Not because I'm better than them, because without your grace, that's who I am. But I pray for them. So I'm on my way to New Testament priesthood, maturity, serving God and loving God and serving others and being a blessing to others. Amen. Doing unto others what Jesus would do for them. And when I do it unto them, I do it unto him. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So know our enemy. The apostle Paul called someone that we give a title, Satan, which means the adversary, the enemy. When the Bible says Satan did this, it means the enemy did this. You need to know your enemy. Your enemy's name is not Satan. Your enemy's name is not the devil. Those are titles. Those are descriptives. What do we call them in English? Adjectives. They're describing somebody. Now, yes, they become a proper noun because we use them that way. The devil, you know. But it's really an adjective because his name is Helel ben Shakir. You'll find out what that means in a few moments. Stick with me. Paul calls Satan, the adversary, the God of this world. And he uses the same word that we use for God, Almighty. He's the God of this world, but it's a little g. God Almighty is a big G. El Shaddai, whoever you, whatever other, other title you want to give our God, that's a big G. But the word in Greek is theos. He's the theos of this world. He's the God of this world. And then... In 2 Corinthians, in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, he's the God of this age. What's an age? It's a time period. An age, like let's look at the, uh, the age of the raptors or the age of the brontosaurus or the age of T-Rex. There was an age where they were in ascendancy, where they were ruling. He's called the God of this age. What age are we living in right now? This age. Who's the God of this age? Satan. Who's the God over? Jesus. And we see Jesus high and lifted up. But the Bible also tells us we do not yet see everything under Jesus' feet. But God put everything under his feet. He put everything under Jesus' feet. How? What's the word I've taught you? Positionally. Theologically, everything is under his feet. But experientially, Hillel ben Shakir is still around, and he's still doing stuff, and he's still disrupting the plan. You know, I love it. Here's a good example for you. There's a guy, and he's breaking into somebody's house. And a policeman happens to be coming down the street in his car. His cruiser shines a light, sees the guy trying to break in. He gets out of the car and says, stop in the name of the law. And what's the thief do? He said, no, 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 he doesn't run. He says, oh, you're the cops. I, I surrender. You're in charge. Take me away. No, he doesn't. He runs away. Why does he run away? So he can come back another day. Jesus is the victor. Jesus said, Satan, I have defeated you. And Satan says, put me in jail. Go ahead, put me in jail. Take me away. No, he doesn't. He runs away. And he disguises himself as an angel of light. He makes people think he's okay. And that's how he gets their minds all befuddled. How's that word, befuddled? Have you been befuddled lately? 
confused. He's the prince of confusion. We're going to talk about a few things today, and I hope I don't keep you too long. If I do, buy me a coffee. <laughs> buy yourself one. Amen? I asked Jazz today, I said, is Yomadi coming today? Because I didn't see her after a few minutes. I figured, well, she dropped you up, but she'll be in. She says, no, she, I, she went to get coffee. <laughs> She's the one that needs to be here singing on time, but she dropped you off. I got it. What? Yeah, I know. I, I feel so sorry for you today. <laughs> but I thank God for the power of healing that touched your body today. And for your mom. Thank God. Give God another hand clap today and praise Him. Hallelujah. Hey, clap your hands loud. Where are, where are we right now? We have not left where we are. Where are we right now? We're in the second heavens. We have gone up. Heaven's come down. We've gone up. We've met together. And we're still there. And we're still there as long as you remain there. When your mind starts to go in other places and wander, what time do I have to get the roast on? Am I going to get a seat in the restaurant? Am I gonna, you start to shh, you're falling down. You're like Peter. Right now we're walking on water, but if we get our minds off of Jesus, we're going to start to sink. Amen. So we're in the heavenly places right now. And when we clap our hands in the heavenly places, it's like thunder to the devil. And he's afraid of thunder. We're not afraid of thunder. We're not afraid of boulders in our way. Because love casts out all fear. Amen. Amen. We have a testimony yesterday about a young lady who had a boulder in front of her life. A big, big boulder. And it was staring at her and she couldn't defeat it. But love came. And love took care of that fear. Amen. Amen. Tony, Gio, myself, and her husband, we helped Dale get through an obstacle she couldn't get through herself. There are times we need others to help us. Because Halel Ben Shakir is after us. And he's trying to make us afraid of things that we don't have to be afraid of. If the Lord is on my side, whom shall I fear? No one. Amen? But I digress. Let me go back on. So he's also given another title. Another phrase is used. He's the God of this world. He is the God of this age. He is the prince of the power of the air. Now, that means in this realm that we're in, the second heavens, this is the air that we're in now. When we're down on earth, we're in the atmosphere of earth. But when we get into the second heavens, we're in a different air. And when you get into God's throne, you're in a different place. The atmosphere is different in each one. He's the prince of the powers of this air realm. And he is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Who's the disobedient one? The child? No, not until they become of age. The disobedient one was Adam. And we're all Adam's children. And we're all suffering for the deed that Adam did. When he did not keep the garden, when he did not rebuke the enemy that came in to deceive his wife and to destroy their world, he did not take care of it. He was with her, the Bible says. Eve took the fruit and gave it to her husband who was with her because Hillel ben Shakir did something, deceived them, deceived her, and then he followed along. He's the prince of the power of the air. Now, when we think of the word prince, what do we think of? The son of a king, right? But that's not all that it means. That is one of the meanings of prince. How many of you know that words sometimes have different meanings, a level of meanings, right? So the word prince in Greek is the word archo, or archon, or is it, there's variations of that. Archi, arch, like archangel, prince angel. Okay? Now, prince, in that understanding of that Greek word, when they talked about this in those days, when they would use that word to describe somebody or something going on, they would say, this is a prince. They would say, this is the one who's first in ruling order. Now, we think of the king as the first in ruling order. But the king, in according to the Greek thinking, is a prince. He's a ruler who's number one. Okay? Now, look at me in, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And I'll show you why it's important to understand this. Okay? Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, the letter that Jesus is speaking to John, and it says, and this is from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. He was resurrected. And he is the prince of the kings of the earth. So what does that mean? 
that he's under them because he's only a prince and they're kings? No, he's the prince. He's the number one ruler over all the kings of the earth. So of all the rulers in heavenly places, of all those who sit on thrones, he is the ruler over them all. That's what the word prince means. So it's an important thing. So when, when uh, the apostle Paul calls Satan the prince of the powers of the air, what he's saying is there are many kings, many thrones. Remember how it says in Ephesians, principalities, powers, authorities, rulers, thrones, different things. These are different names or titles given to these fallen angels and also to other angels who are still serving God. In uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says that he is the prince of the power of the air and you walked underneath his realm. Jesus is the prince of all the kings of the earth. So he is the one that we have to understand. He is the king of kings. Every prince in this thinking is a king. Every prince is a king in this way of thinking. But now that's not our, our Eastern, or that's not our Western way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking. So we have to adjust our thinking when we read the Bible. When we read the word, the word is not a Western piece of literature. It's not written to the Western mind. We read left to right. They read right to left. So there's a different way of thinking about it. You see it differently. You memorize it differently. So I'm going to go deeper into this age right now, a little deeper into the kingdom age, because the age of the church is coming to an end. And I've talked about this, I don't know how many times over the years of being here, 40 years of being here, talked about the church age, that there were 2,000 years in the beginning. From Adam, from Abra from Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years, and that was the first age of the father. The second age was the age of the son. That was from Abraham and Isaac, when Isaac is being offered, and then God says, no, save the son, I'm going to offer my son. From Isaac unto Jesus on the cross is 2,000 years. And then from the descent of the Holy Spirit up until today is about 2,000 years. In fact, it'll be 2,000 years in, 27, in 2027. That's when it will be exactly 2,000 years. So we're right at the end of the church age. One age for the Father, one age for the Son, one age for the Holy Spirit. After that is the kingdom age. That's the millennium. It's coming. We're ushering it in. It's, it's, it's almost here. You are born in the most exciting time ever on the earth. You're here. Some of you say, I wish I lived a long time ago. You, you didn't miss anything. They lived with dirt floors. They had no toilets. No running water. I wish I was back in Jesus' day. Yeah, they didn't even shampoo. Forget about it. You know? So, no, you're in the right time. You're in a good, a good place, okay? So, we need to remember these things, okay? Now, everybody that is called into warfare is called to overcome. And remember, the overcomer is not the one who worships best, not the one who preaches best, not the one who does signs and wonders. The overcomer is the Christian who puts their flesh under control. The Christian is the one who walks with the fruit of the Spirit. Gifts do not bring rewards. You can speak in tongues, it's a gift. Speaking in tongues will give you no reward in heaven. Speaking in tongues is for now. Okay? The gift of discerning of spirits will give you no reward in heaven. It's for now. Working in miracles will give you no reward in heaven. That's for now. Nobody needs a miracle in heaven. We need them now. But you don't get a reward because it's not you. It's the gift. But fruit, now that's different. And God, Jesus said about his father, he said, my father loves fruit. He's a fruit collector. He says, I have ordained you. I have chosen you, I have called you, chosen you, and ordained you that you should bear much fruit, for this glorifies my Father. You see, speaking in tongues, doing miracles, singing great, preaching great, that makes us feel good. But fruit makes him feel good. Don't be a man pleaser. If you sing, if you speak in tongues, if you worship, if you work a sign or wonder, you do it unto God. And he gets the glory. But your fruit, you give unto God. And he is happy. Am I clear on overcoming? I hope I'm really clear on being an overcomer. Because we're, we, we think wrong. We think that people who perform these things, they're the overcomer. No, they're not. Hallelujah. Amen. God is after the fruit in our lives. So that's where we have to go. The fruit of God in our lives. Now, 
John chapter 10, verse 10. Let's look at that together. Jesus said, the thief comes to do what? To steal, kill, or destroy, and destroy. If he, if he wants to steal what you've got. If he can't steal it, he tries to kill it. And if he can't kill it completely, he just tries to destroy the whole thing. So he's always trying to do something horrible. But John chapter 12, verse 31 says this. John 12, 31. Now the judgment of this world has come. And the prince of this world is being cast out. Judgment has come. Now, judgment didn't come yet because Jesus wasn't crucified yet. And judgment didn't come yet because Jesus wasn't glorified yet. So judgment is coming. And the prince of this world is not cast out yet. He's being cast out. It's a process. It's taking place. There's time going on here. But it is done as far as God's concerned. God says, it's finished. It's done. That's it. We win. I know it's on the end of the book, Revelation. I know that there's a new heavens and a new earth. It's finished. Everything is done. It's all done in heaven, but it's not done yet here on the earth. So without a doubt, Satan is the prince of this world. He's the god of this world. He's the prince of all the powers of the air, and he's the present ruler over all rulers of the earth. Halel ben Shakir is number one on the earth, in the air, over us. He's number one. But Jesus is in another realm over him, and the kingdom is coming. And as the kingdom comes, as my dad said, it pushes that other stuff down closer. That makes it harder for us. But that's why we worship. That's why we do warfare, so that we can break through all the tricks and schemes of the enemy. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. And they prevailed not. Neither was there found any more place for them in heaven. And the great dragon, that's another name or title for Hillel ben Shakir. That great dragon was cast out. Jesus said, he is being cast out. Judgment's coming. He's being cast out. Jesus said, I saw him fall. In other words, he said, I've seen it already. It's in my mind. It's a done deal. But it hasn't happened yet. Well, somebody said, but yeah, well, but Satan fell a long time ago and took one third of the angels with him. Yeah, that's one fall, but there's another fall. That was the fall of his world. Now he's in our world. Now there's a fall coming for our world, and that's what this is talking about here. Okay, because in, in the beginning of, of, of the Revelation, chapter 4, uh, the Spirit says, come up here and I'll show you things that will come to pass. So this is chapter 12. Chapter 4 is before 12. That means what happened in chapter 4 is telling us what's going to come to pass after. So there's a falling of Satan that's to come. There's a judgment that's to come. Has he been judged already? In one sense, yes. Listen, the thief breaking in has been judged already. He's a thief. In God's eyes, he's guilty. He will pay. He may not pay here, but he'll pay later. You see, it's a done thing. Positionally, it's already done. But experientially, he may get away with it for a while. But in the end, positionally, positional truth will run out and rule over all experiential truth. If, uh, uh, so I, as I'm saying in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, these are things that must take place. What Jesus talked about, in Luke 10, 18, and what we're seeing in, in Revelation, these are things that are positional truths, and these things have to come to pass. There will be a time when these things take place. Now, Satan means the adversary, as, again, as I said, right? His name is, what did I say in, in Hebrew? Hillel ben Shakir. We're not going to go around and saying, oh, Hillel ben Shakir is after me. In fact, we don't even call him by his name. His name is Lucifer in English. Lucifer, it's not even English, actually. It's probably Latin. Lucy, luce means light, right? In Greek, in Latin, in Italian, those, those languages there. His name is Lucifer. The name Lucifer is, can be translated the morning star. But Jesus has been given the title the bright morning star because he has replaced Lucifer. He has defeated him. He has become the bright morning star. The morning star... It's called the morning star because in the mind of the ancients, it was the star that brought the light of day. It was the last star of the evening, and it was the star that brought the light of day. And that's one of his titles. That's what his name means. It also means day star. But again, Jesus has been now given that name. He's the day star from on high. So he's the highest day star, okay? In Hebrew, hello ben Shakir literally means this, the shining one. Or... 
Whenever there's Ben before another name, another word, like Hillel Ben Shakir, Ben means son of. So Hillel Ben Shakir means the son of the dawn, the shining one, the morning star. We don't see the morning stars anymore. You know why? Too much light all around us. There's too much ambient light. We have street lights, traffic lights, car lights. We have house lights. We've got all sorts of lights on all the time. We don't see it. But if you're in the, in the places where it's dark in the morning, there's a star that will shine in the morning. It's the brightest star. It's the one that says day is coming. It's the light bringer. It announces the daytime. That's what he was. He was the bringer of the sun. Lucifer. Hillel ben Shakir. The shining one. The bringer of the sun. He was the one that God chose to announce and proclaim and to display his glory. But he fell. Why? The Bible tells us clearly, pride. He allowed pride to work in himself so badly that he said, I will set my throne above God's throne. Somehow he became deluded. Somehow his thinking got unclear. Somehow he got into some thinking of, we're all God, and I will ascend as the chief God. And he was wrong. What did he deceive Eve and say? Eat of this, you shall become a God like me. People still want to be gods. They want to control. They want to be in charge. Amen. That's why death to self is so difficult. Because we don't want to die to our desires. We don't want to let our reputation go away. We don't want to let our dreams fall apart. But if you just replace your dreams with his dreams. But I don't know what his dreams are. Abraham didn't know where he was going. God said, come out of Ur of the Chaldees. Come out of the home where you live. He lived in Babylon. He lived in a neighborhood of Babylon. Ur was, is like, a, like a, a province of Babylon. And God said, come, and I will bring you to a land. I will show you, and I'm going to give it to you. And Abraham says, where are we going? He says, just start walking, and I'll direct you. I'll guide your steps. Yeah, but how, where, when do I, how do I know where to turn? How do I know what to do? Trust me. What if I make, what if I make a mistake? Don't worry. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back. I'll get you back on track. Amen? Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. So Lucifer is the shining one. Now, how many of you, how many of you really believe, and I, and I know this is not, I'm not making fun of anybody, because I believed it at one point. I didn't know what to believe besides it. That's what I was taught. But how many of you believed that in the Garden of Eden, a literal serpent, you know, came up and talked with Eve? Most people do. And in fact, people will say, when the serpent visited Eve, he walked upright because serpents used to have legs. But after, after that, God cursed him to crawl on the ground and his legs disappeared. That's a good explanation. And they'll even go into, you know, the, the uh, science of looking at reptiles and stuff and seeing, are there really little stubby legs that are sometimes under the skin or something, you know? Yeah, they, they, they're trying to prove that Satan used to be a serpent. Isn't that? But that's not what he was. You see, in Hebrew, and I've said this before to you also, in Hebrew, when it says that Satan presented himself to Eve, it says the shining one came. That word that's translated serpent, which is translated snake to us, it's so, it's, it actually is the shining one. And who is the shining one? Hello, Ben Shakir. He came as the shining one. He was glorious in his armor. He was glorious in his ways. He was the bringer of the day. He was the one that all respected. Now, yes, he was fallen, but even in his fall, he was still glorious. And he deceived her. How could he deceive her? Because he'd been around so much longer. He was able to spin and weave words. We don't have the whole discussion we don't know how long it took for the whole thing to take place. This could have worked out over years. This could have been something that he started slowly, you know, doing, you know, it's like, like Gio says all the time, put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out. But if you put a frog in a pot of water and little by little raise the heat, you've got cooked frog. So we don't know how it happened. But we do know this, the shining one in Hebrew is talking about Satan, Lucifer, and it's the shining one who talked with Eve and deceived her and it's the shining one that Adam should have said, get out of my garden. But he didn't. 
because he also was not. How could someone so beautiful, so bright, be bad? How could a preacher who does such wonderful things, he preaches so well, he does this, he's, he has 10 jets, he flies all around the world, he does all, how could he be bad? Well, he could be an angel in disguise. He could have been deceived too. He could now want all the riches of the earth, thinking that that's the pleasure, the pleasure of God, that wealth proves godliness. Wealth doesn't prove anything of that at all. Godliness is proved by you being content with what you have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So you can keep your 10 planes. You can, you can take, a, take an offering for another one. You can stand on your platform and, and throw money down and say, money comes to me, and it does, because they're all being bewitched out there. Paul would say today to members of many mega churches, who hath bewitched you? You started off good. Who bewitched you to believe that you should throw money at the feet of some guy who preaches all this stuff about prosperity and all these things, and money comes to me? <laughs> Well, they can't take it with them. But that's okay because they know how to spend it. They know how to spend it. They know how to live. They live large. But anyway, let's go back on where we're going. Let me get back on track because, again, I digress. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's learn about our enemy a little bit today. Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 13. Now, remember, the Bible many times takes something in the natural and then just, bam, blasts it into the spiritual realm. So when you start looking at the natural right away, you're saying, oh, it's a natural situation. But then all of a sudden you realize there's a key, there's a clue, there's something in here that says God's not just talking about some guy back then. He has moved into a whole other thing. So in, in chapter 28 of Ezekiel, verse 13, God is talking about somebody in the beginning of the chapter, but then he switches it and he talks about the one behind the scenes, Hela ben Shakir. He said, you were, in the, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, diamonds, barrels, the onks, jasper, sapphires, emeralds, carbuncles, gold. Eh, that was all yours. The workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day you were born or created. In other words, he's saying, Lu Lucifer, Satan, you are a worshiper. Tabrets are uh, instruments of percussion. Drums, tambourines, tabrets, these are things that they would call tabrets. Pipes are instruments of sound, like the pipes of a pipe organ. You know there are churches, cathedrals, where they have a pipe organ built that takes up the entire wall of a cathedral. You have to be a, 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 a tremendous musician to play it. And it's foot pedals and bass notes, and the tiniest notes are there. And it was prepared in the cathedral. And that's what God is talking about inside of Satan. He says, your tabrets, your ability to use percussion, sound, and volume, and softness was built in you. Your pipes, your ability to sing and to do things and to make your voice do all these things it was built in you. He was the lead worshiper. He was the day star. He's the one that announced the sun. He was the one that announced that the day has begun. He's the, he's the lead worshiper. He says, you were the anointed cherub that covered I made you who you were. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down amidst the stones of fire. These are things that we don't even know about, but we're getting a view of something that was special and unique. And this goes beyond the Garden of Eden that we have here. This is talking about when, when before man was, a, was, was, was created, that the earth was here and there was a Garden of Eden then. God didn't create everything that we see in the Bible in Genesis. He recreated he created Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Part 2 says, and the earth became void, empty, and waste. He didn't create it. You can't create emptiness. You can't create the void. You don't create the waste. That's a destruction. And that was the destruction of the first fall of Satan. Where he was in the Garden of Eden. He was in the Eden of God. Heaven was heaven on earth at that time. And there was all these things and they were real. All the stuff that we have. Stones and beauty and, and gold and silver and, and money and things. This was all a part of their world. We don't realize it. But this is what he had. All the same things. That's why he uses these things to delude people now and to deceive them now. He knows the power of these things. And then it says this. You were perfect. In all your ways, until iniquity was found in you. Iniquity means up and down. 
up and down, in and out, in and out. You know what was in Peter when he was walking on water? The moment he began to look at the wind and the waves, iniquity entered in and he began to go down. When he had his eyes on Jesus, he's walking on water. But iniquity, fear, doubts, all the other things, circumstances, the things, iniquity, when Satan allowed the things of the earth to blind him and to get his eyes off God and to become to think that he's the biggest, he's the best, then he began to sink. And he, you see, Edgar was saying before, in order to rise up, you have to go down sometimes. Well, when you're rising up on your own, guess what? In God's eyes, you are going down in a different way. And Satan went down. The multitude of your merchandise filled your heart with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I will cast you out as profane from the mountain of God. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. God's saying, I'm going to get you. One day, you say, and we say, why doesn't God do it now? Because his plan is bigger than ours. So Lucifer was the leader of worship. Ezekiel talks about the workmanship of your tablets and your pipes was built inside of you. He had the talent beyond compare, able to do things that no one else could do. It was built in him. He knows the power of worship. And so what he's done today, know your enemy. Hundreds of years have gone by. In the beginning of the church, the early church, the church knew how to worship God. They knew how to sing his praises. They danced and sang before the Lord. Their hearts were pure and clean. But as time went by, Satan began to take control of things. And then church music began to become solemn music. All solemn. Pomp and circumstance began, began to be the way of the day. Churches were filled. Bishops rose up with big hats. And, and, and then there were popes on thrones. And all these things happened. And Lucifer was behind it all changing it all and he took the number one powerful thing of the church and he perverted it he changed it he twisted it he made it profane or common or dirt like like himself worship music and the church entered into an age you know that in the 1500s they only had certain types of music in the church and when the first person brought in a piano the piano was created and they brought it into the church to play there were people who rebelled against it. They burned the piano. They burned the church. They killed the person. That was Satan. When they brought violins in, they, they, they killed people. No, you're, you're touching the holy thing. You're you're, church music is solemn. No, church music should be what it is, celebratory. It should also be quiet and reverential. It should be all these things, not just one thing. So he took it and he twisted it, he perverted it. And for hundreds of years, church music was like that. You have been blessed because you didn't grow up with that kind of music only. You have entered into the church where there's church music where we're singing a new song unto the Lord. We're worshiping him with a new way. We have come into singing, praising, speaking in tongues, singing in tongues, dancing before the Lord, flags and banners and all these things. This is all the way it used to be. It's all been returned. What was gone is now back. But Satan is doing something else. Because he knows how powerful music is, because he knows how powerful worship is, he is taking it and perverting it, and he's making it about money. It's not the church music ministry. It's the church music industry. Music in the church, and I mean all the music that's created out there, like it or not, it is an industry. It's a business. It's all about the money. We don't know it, we don't feel it because we're not in it. We're, we're only enjoying what we hear. But those that are making it, they find out it's all about the money. It's all about the way you have to create your song to have a certain feel or a certain touch. It has to have, right now there's a certain music that's going on. It's like music, there, there's music that we used to listen to back in the drug days, back in the 60s. You'd listen to music like Inagata de Vida. You'd listen to music that it was 15, 20 minutes long for a song. They just kept playing the same thing over and over and over again. You know why? Because everybody was stoned out of their minds. And they're like, oh, this is really cool. This is really groovy. You wake up 15 minutes later. Is this song still playing? Oh, that was cool, man. I really went somewhere. 
And that's what Satan is doing to the church music today. He has come into the church and he's bringing in the music that just keeps playing. It's a loop. Where did it go after the drug era? It went into the discotheque. And what did it become? It became techno music. And it became that beat. Nowadays, it's in the other, there's another, there's a different club music nowadays. But it's always the same beat, the tappets. It's always the same percussion. It's always the same. It's, it is hypnotic. It is to get your mind to shut down. In worship, our minds don't shut down. Our minds become electrified. Our minds become filled with God. But when you allow church your worship music to put you into a spin, into a sleep, you are falling under the spell of Satan, believe it or not. He has entered into the church world, and it's made the industry about money. He's turned church services into concerts. Now it's not about the worship and the presence of God. It's about lights and smoke and all things going on in a concert. If you have a real concert for God, you don't need lights and smoke. You don't need these things to put all these extras in. Because the presence of God is there. The glory of God is there. If you really worship God, God himself will come. Light will come into the place. Angels will sing. We don't need smoke machines and light machines. But Satan's brought it into the church. Where was it first? I know where it was first because I remember being in the music industry myself back in the late 60s, in the mid-60s. What we needed, we had a band. We were the best band in our area. We won every battle of the bands we had. But we wanted to get a smoke machine. We wanted to get a light machine. We wanted to pump it up and make it better. We never even needed that stuff. But we thought that's the way to go. And the church is caught up with that. So church services are concerts now. Yes. With all this stuff. He's making counterfeit worship music. It's counterfeit. It doesn't have the real thing to it. it looks like it. it. Smells like it. Sounds like it. You know, it has a feel to it. It makes me feel. Yeah, but it's appealing to your flesh. We're missing out. The church has been infiltrated. He's hijacked Christian music. He doesn't want true worshipers. I've been teaching you about worship for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And as we enter his presence, his presence comes, his glory comes. Healing is immediate in the presence of God. Immediate. We're not begging God. Lord, I, I mean, I, I, you said call on the elders. They'll pray for the sick. Lord, bring healing right now. I felt that Peter, I prayed for Peter's ears. He'd been having an infection in his ear. I prayed for his ear. I could feel the power of God go into his body and touch his ear. I said, God's doing it now. Hallelujah. Jill's been walking around. If you see her feet, her toes are black and blue. She stumbled and, and hit her feet and then hit him again another day. Black and blue. She's walking around well, beyond what's normal. Why? Because we're staying in the presence of the Lord. We're using our worship to give God glory, not to entertain our senses. Mm -hmm. People don't know the difference between the Spirit of God in a song and their emotions in a song. Last night, after having a day out in Long Island, in beautiful Port Jefferson, in a beautiful basement, <laughs> fixing things up, taking care of things, and working together, we went to a patio pizza place in St. James, New York, where the man put a Trump flag a backing Trump flag in the back of his restaurant. And a lady came by. It's in, in the town of Smithtown, which is a large township with many towns in it. St. James is one. And she saw this and she said, take that flag down. I'm offended by that flag. How can you do that? This is a pizzeria. What are you doing? And the guy's wife got nervous. This woman was a powerful woman. She was the president of the Smithtown Women's Association for something. Big, powerful woman. She said, literally, I'm going to destroy this place. And she posted stuff on Facebook, and she did stuff at their meetings, and blah, blah, blah. We're going to destroy that place. Well, you know what happened? Fox News heard about it. And one day, he got a phone call. He said, Fox News is on the phone with me. And then the next thing you know, President Trump heard about it, and he flew over on his way to New York. He flew over St. James and get a flyover, and he sent a tweet out. He said, go visit Patio Pizza, best place in the round. Thank you so much. And so we went there. They've been there. We went there with them. And... I, I had a chance to sing. They pushed me into this. They told people, we got a great singer over here. You should sing. And they're like, you know, can you sing? You want to sing? I said, well, you know, if they make me do it, I'll do it. You know, I enjoy it, but, you know, I don't, I'm not used to it. We got up and we sang. I sang what? What did I sing? I got you under my skin, Gio, right? And I sang Pennies from Heaven. I had a great time. I enjoyed it. It's emotional. It touches the flesh. I know what that arena is like. I lived in that arena. That was where I wanted to be the rest of my life. But that's not what I do up here. I don't do that up here. I worship him up here. I sing with my eyes closed most of the time because I'm not singing for you. I'm singing unto Jesus. I'm singing for the glory of God, not for the feelings I get of my flesh. 
I know the difference. And I'm telling you, in the Christian music world, there's a difference between what's being packaged and sold to you in CDs and what you're hearing on certain stations and what certain churches are pumping out than what we're getting from God. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. Now, I'm making this point today because I want to show you something that goes beyond reason in a sense. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 6. Satan wants a carnal church that feeds on entertainment rather than God's spirit. While you're turning, Isaiah 14, 6. Satan wants a carnal church, a fleshly church, an emotion-filled church, a church that tingles with feelings of emotion, not with the presence of God. And so we have the substitutes, the smoke machines, the light machines, the great sound, all the instruments, the singing, the voices, the talent. It's all great. But there's a difference between talent and anointing. Somebody who doesn't know how to sing can become anointed and sing beautifully. Talent is a gift. There's no glory, no rewards for talent. But the anointing can come upon anyone. And God says, I love that sound. Isaiah 14, 6, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted, and none stop it. Now, I know many translations say it differently. I'm trying to go to a deeper root meaning of the words. So yours might say, and none stopped him when he did the hindering, when he did the persecution, when he did this and that, that is a mental man's understanding of the Bible. People don't understand the revelatory aspect that's in the Word of God, and so translators many times miss the depth of what God is saying because they can't perceive it. But the, de the depths of this is that he that ruled the nations in anger, who is the one that rules the nations in anger? The God of this world, the God of this age, the prince of the powers of the air. He rules in anger. He is persecuted, and none stops it. Nothing will stop it. Satan can be persecuted. That word persecuted means chased, driven away, hunted down, and none can stop it. He can't stop it. God has given us the ability to come after Shekinah. Hela ben Shakir, the shining one, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, whatever you want to call it, the great old dragon. He's given us the ability to come after him, to hunt him down, to chase him and to drive him out. And how do we do it? Worship. By worshiping our God. Because the one thing he cannot stand is worship. Because he used to lead the worship. He was the great worshiper. He was the great one. And now... He crawls the earth, feeding on dust. What did God say man is made of? Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Satan, you shall eat dust now. He feeds on you and me. His, his pleasure, his enjoyment is eating you up. Killing, stealing, destroying. That's his food. And what is it that, that he's going after? Our flesh. Our carnal senses. Our carnal abilities. Our entertainment factor. That's what he's going after. So how do we fight him? We don't give in to the flesh. We war against our own flesh. We crucify our flesh. Paul says, I, have, I crucify my flesh every once in a while. I know I need to do it. Because every once in a while, something happens to me. i got to crucify my flesh today. No, he says, I die daily. I die daily. When you get up in the morning, I used to say, when you get up in the morning, say, hello, conqueror. Now what I'm saying is, when you get up in the morning, say, hello, dead man. I'm crucifying you today. I'm crucifying you with your lust and your flesh, your pride of life, your deceitfulness of riches, and all these things that want to come and take over my life and keep me bound on a carnal existence where I cannot worship God in spirit and truth, where all I do is have to get feelings, and I, I feel good, I feel God's in it, I feel God's in it, I mean, maybe God's in it, I feel, I, I feel, no, God wants to lead us by his spirit with understanding. When you know that you know that you know, not that you're praying for it, 
Well, I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for Why are you believing God for something? What do you mean you're believing God for something? You're trying to convince yourself that God's going to do it because you're convincing yourself God's going to do it. Well, I'm believing God. I'm believing God. I'm believing God. You are deluding yourself. You are being fed alive by the prince of the power of the air, and you're being fed into a car. I'm, I'm believing God. I'm getting a new car. I'm believing God for a new car. I'm getting it. Why? Why do you want a new car? Why don't you just want a car? How about a good car? How about a car that runs? How about a car that doesn't break down that much? Well, that means I need a new one. Now, you can get an old one. It's still good. Well, you can put yourself in debt for the next 10 years. You can put yourself in a position where you've got insurance payments that go through the roof. And you can't do this, and you can't do that, you can't do it. And, and, and then you say, when they say, it's time to collect tithes and offerings. Oh, I don't have anything to give. But you got your new car. You're driving your tithes. And the Lord says, there goes the thief driving that shiny car. Because that's my tithes, and the tithes are holy. They belong to me. They're not yours. Somebody said to me, well, I decided to do this with my tithes. I said, who told you you could do that with your tithes? He said, well, I prayed about it. I, and I said, and you heard from God? He said, well, I, I prayed about it, and I, I felt God. I didn't feel God was telling me don't do it. God doesn't have to tell you not to do it. His word says the tithe is mine, says the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. You don't have a right to make a decision about what your tithe is. Your tithe is 10% of your income, and it's God's. You don't, you don't tell Uncle Sam when he says 28% is what I get. You don't tell him, well, I'm going to give you 18%. You'll go to jail. He'll take your bank account. He will lock your business. He'll take away your stuff. Why? Because it's his. He demands it. God says the tithe is mine. But God doesn't demand it. God says it's your choice, though. You can either give it or you can live it and eat it and you can do your own thing with it and then you'll pay the price later on. So we need to understand what God wants of us and what Satan is trying to do to us. He's trying to trick us with the deceitfulness of money. If you give God 10%, you know, in, in, in the natural world, 10 minus 1 is 9. 100 minus 10 is 90. 1,000 minus 100 is whatever it is. 10% is 10%. In the natural world, when you take 10% away, you have less. But in God's world, when you take 10% away, you have more. Because God says, when you give me 10%, I'm going to write down you gave me 100%, because I know how hard it is to do that. I'm giving, you, I'm giving you a bonus. So when you have your $100 check or your $100 gift or whatever it is you got, and you give $10 to God, God says, write down they gave me 100 But Lord, that's, write down they gave me 100 because I'm going to bless them as if they gave me everything, because I know how hard it was for them to give me that 10%. And you got your check of $457, and you write God's check out for $457, or $45.70. Bump it up. Go to 48 <laughs> Round it up. Give him 50 What's the big deal? Stop being deceived by money. God knows how to give you money that you don't even understand where it could come from. But if you're holding on to every penny, if you're holding on to every dollar, and you're watching everything and say, I can't give this to God, God can't, you're going to be lost. He's getting you. Now, how am I shifting from worship and praise? And this? I'm talking about Hello Ben Shakir. Know your enemy. That's my message. Know your enemy. He's going after your wallet. He's going after your pocketbook. He's after your mind. He's after the way you think. The lust of the eye, the pride of life, and the deceitfulness of money. Those are the three things. You overcome them, you are an overcomer. The lust of the eye. Lust of the eye comes in a lot of different ways. One of, the, one of the easiest ways we see it is in the way we dress. We are appealing to the eye. This makes me look good. This makes me look better. We, we, or, or like, you know, the skirt, you know. Well, this is nice, but ooh, that's better. <laughs> the lust of the eye. We are falling for thinking our flesh should be attractive. Now, we shouldn't look stupid or dirty or ugly or smelly. That doesn't make sense. But you don't go around making the flesh be alluring. That was the work of the fallen ones that came to earth, the sons of God that came to earth. They taught women how to do the art of seduction. The lust of the eye. The pride of life. Being first, being in control. Uh, sometimes the martyr is in control. I never get my way. Nobody ever likes me. I never get nothing. They're being in control. 
It's a reverse control, but it's still control. They're going to get somebody to give them sympathy. That's what they're, they're feeding on sympathy. That's the illusion of Satan. Then the deceitfulness of money, thinking that money is going to make you happy. It doesn't make you happy. If money's making you happy, you've fallen for the lie. Amen? Money is a tool. Amen. It's to be used to glorify God. Amen. Know your enemy. He's after us. He's especially after worship in the church. He's especially, because if he can get the church an entertainment center, the church is powerless. No matter how big it is, it's powerless. That's why mega churches don't change the city they're in. They make no change in the city. The ghetto is still the ghetto. Because they're all about their money. They're all about their programs. But their programs don't change society. But when the church was the church in the early days of the church, you read the book of Acts, chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10, you see that the church changed society. They thought differently. They worshiped God, and God came. And when God came into their houses, when they were praying and singing songs, the, the Bible says, and the house shook where they were with the presence of God. And it says nobody was poor because they shared. Those who were rich, they would give some of what they had. And it would be used. And it says, and they came and laid money at the apostles' feet. Not because money comes to me. Read the next two words for distribution. They came and gave them money and said, distribute this. Use it where it needs to be used. I have people come to me many times. They just hand me money and say, put this to good work. Well, putting it to good work would mean I put it, put it into a new car. <laughs> or I put it into a new shirt, new suit. I could put it to good work that way. I could do it. But that's delusion. Putting it to good work means taking care of widows and the children who are orphaned in their need. Am I making sense? We need to worship God. Worship, is, it becomes a part of our life. And when we worship God, Satan cringes. They back up. <laughs> Having your hands is like thunder to them. They're afraid of thunder. They know the church is rising. They know the church is coming. The storm clouds are coming. The church is building up its strength. And they see the banners and the flags. When we're leaning on our beloved, when we're not trusting in the world, we're not trusting in our looks, we're not trusting in our talents, when we're not trusting in these things and we're leaning on our beloved, we come out of the wilderness like an army with banners. Hallelujah. Amen. Satan's afraid of you when you worship. When you're driving your new car, when you're eating your tithes, when you're dressing to kill, he's not afraid of you. He's got you. You're carnal. And you're going to stay that way. Because he's going to make sure you get complimented. But when you worship, when you die to self, he doesn't compliment you. He hates you. He hates you. He's angry. But you can persecute him. You can chase him, you can hunt him down, you can find him out, you can see where he's been sneaking around, and you can have the victory over him. How? By worshiping the Lord. Learning how to worship in spirit and in truth. Becoming a New Testament priest, a worshiping warrior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. My God. Shantarabatai. Oh, laboroto moshando. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. Lord, we bless you. We praise your mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that song, Soul on Fire. You know why? Because it really tells the truth. I'm waiting to become a soul on fire. I'm working at becoming a soul on fire. I want to be a soul on fire. I don't want to be just some, you know, smoking flax or, you know, a fire going out. I want to be burning. I want to shine for God. And how do I shine for God? I love the poor. I take care of people. I, I'm, I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm gentle. I'm all those things. And that's how I'm loving God because I'm loving his people. I'm being all those things. Amen? And I'm a worshiper. Amen. I'm a worshiper. Amen? Father, in Jesus' name, we come together with you right now. We ask you, Lord God, wrap your arms around us, Lord God, as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your children. I bless them in your name, Lord God. Let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon us. And Lord, keep us walking in the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap and praise Him. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day and enjoy this wonderful day together.